the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today, as we focus on the second Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tooth, we are reminded of God's love for mankind. This is the theme of the month. And today we hear a story of a lawyer who came to put Christ to the test. Little did he know that in testing Christ, he himself would truly be tested. There is a question that each of us must ask every day of our lives. We ask many questions, actually. We say things to ourselves like, what should I eat? We say, what should I wear? We say, what should I watch today? What should I say? What am I doing today? Right? We ask many questions uh, as the days go on. But the question that we must ask every day of our lives is, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is the question that the, the lawyer came to test Christ. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do we begin each day or each activity with this thought in mind? If not, it'll be very difficult for us to remember that every part of life is meant to loving God. Every part of life is to loving my neighbor. And when the Lord is tested and he's asked this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He answers by saying, what is written in the law? How do you read it? What's your understanding of it? And the lawyer answered him saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Christ said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer desiring to kind of like justify himself, he says to Christ, it's not part of today's gospel, but it's a continuation from Luke chapter 10. He says, and who's my neighbor? He kind of goes on to this dialogue. And we'll go into that in a little bit. But sometimes this reminds us, or reminds me, oftentimes we're guilty, I'm guilty, of doing the same thing and trying to test God. We come up with various scenarios in our mind and we theorize that this action or that action or behavior is appropriate based on our own specialized, personalized reading of the gospel. We use an idea that perhaps a certain activity or a certain behavior is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible. Therefore, and you come to your own conclusions. But we have to be reminded that we are not like other denominations with our own tailor-made, unique reading of the Bible that only applies to me and how I'm reading it. As Orthodox Christians, we have, we have God as our Father and the Church as our Mother, which means that we have the teachings of the Church. We have the teachings of the saints to help guide us trying to justify my sinful actions with smooth words and interesting creative philosophies is, is hardly attempting to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. This is where this is true whether or not it applies to a range of sin, whether it's adultery or, or foul language or any other thing in between you can you can think of. The two can't reside together. You can't both test God and hope to be well-pleasing to God. It doesn't work like that. So we shouldn't try to be one person with dual aims and goals that are divergent sometimes. We should try to be a united whole, everything moving together in the right direction. And as a lawyer attempts to put Christ to the test, he himself is tested with the severity. Our Lord puts him on notice with a very simple idea. You cannot possibly begin to understand loving God with all of yourself and all of your strength until you actualize this love concretely towards your neighbor. The love that you desire to have towards God is demonstrated by the actual love that you show to the flesh and blood people around you. To those who are made in the image and likeness of God. 
Love is only a, a, a lofty theory if we continually speak about our love for God. But if we don't lift a finger or break a sweat or to serve or to assist our neighbors, it's a great idea. St. Dorotheos of Gaza once said, the more one is united to his neighbor, the more one he is the more he is united to God. Again, the more one is united to his neighbor, the more he is united to God. So in fact, if we look at our neighbor as a springboard, as a trampoline or a rocket ship that propels us to to quickly move towards God, we can claim to desire with our hearts this love. St. Dorotheos goes on a bit further, and he gives us some practical advice on how we should deal with others. Oftentimes people say, I wish I could be loving to such and such a person, uh, but they're just not loving to me. Like, who has to act first? But here, St. Dorotheos wrote, Do not ask for love from your neighbor. Do not ask for love from your neighbor. For if you ask and he does not respond, you will be troubled. Instead, show your love for your neighbor and you will be at rest. And so you will bring your neighbor love. Don't ask. Don't wait for love to be shown to you. And then you respond. This happens in, with our neighbor. This responds to our, our spouse, to our friends, our family, our siblings. Don't wait. Don't wait to be shown love before you respond. It's this act of love that kindles love, not vice versa. So this is also reflected in the teachings of our Lord. He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. So we do. We do first. The next critical question that the lawyer asked, this is not part of today's gospel. This happens in verse 29. The gospel ends from 21 to 28 from Luke 10. So around verse 29. He says, and who is my neighbor? And I think today we're confused about this. I think social media has weaponized the news to divide people. This is not even about Muslim and Christian anymore. Oftentimes, that would be the, the conversations around the sermons in the Coptic Orthodox Church. That would often be the, the standard of Muslim versus Christian. This is not even it. The, the news has been weaponized to divide people. It uses impersonal communication to challenge real discussion, and it easily leads people to division. Oftentimes, we are not content with seeing people as human, as individuals, as children of God. We are told that the only way to see people is through categories. We should see people as black, as white, as Democrat, as Republican. The list goes on. Categories. There are no more normal people especially me, you either fit neatly into one category or another. Either you are part of the oppressed or you are part of the oppressor. That's it. We have to reject this, this satanic type of division, this, these lies, no matter what form it takes. Each and every single human being is created in the image of God, our creator. We should not participate in anything that renders anyone less than human. Our Lord saw past the labels when he answered the lawyer. He gives him a parable. This is the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in his parable, the hero of the story is the Samaritan. You have to understand, this is a big deal. The Samaritans were considered bad. They were considered ungodly. They were considered less than human by the Jews of the day. 
Yet the Samaritan demonstrates his true knowledge and his true love for God. How? It's through his merciful act of care towards the one who is in need. It's interesting to note that many of the church fathers, this is why we have the church as our mother, that we interpret the Bible a certain way. The church fathers see in this parable the gospel of Christ completely. The Samaritan is a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the church fathers. In fact, if you look in the Eastern Rite, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, in the icon of the Good Samaritan, it's usually Christ himself as the Samaritan. And you can tell because the, behind the halo, there's the cross behind his head. So you know that's always uh, signifying Christ himself. And so the icon typically features our Lord Jesus Christ as the Good Samaritan, as the one who tends to the needs of the man who fell among the thieves. So if this parable is a symbol, then who am I? Who is the man? Who is the man who fell among the thieves? If it's not Christ who fell down and who's beaten, it's each one of us. It's humanity, and we fell prey to Satan and his forces. We were tempted, and we were provoked to sin. And we made a choice. We were beaten, but Christ came to us. He was incarnate. And he found us in that terrible state that we were in, and he had compassion on us. Origen tells us that according to one of the interpreters, that the inn where the man was taken is a symbol of the church. St. Augustine tells us that the wine and the oils are symbols of the powerful and life-giving sacraments of the church. He says, robbers left you half dead on the road but you have been found lying there by the passing and kindly Samaritan. Wine and oil have been poured on you. You have received the sacraments of the only begotten Son. You have been lifted onto his mule. You believe that Christ became flesh. You have been brought to the inn. You are, to be, you are being cured in the church. That is where and why I am speaking. And this is to what, I, what all of us are doing. We are performing the duties of the innkeeper. So when we reflect on this interpretation of the church fathers, the inn is the church, and it's an invitation or a mandate, really, for each one of us to act like the Samaritan, who is Christ, and to bring others, even if we have to carry them, to the church of God, to the inn. When we hear the words of the parable, we are corrected. We are taught to see everyone as human. We see everyone as our neighbor. And we are challenged and expected to show mercy to others, even when it's not convenient to do so. When mercy is convenient and easy, it's, it's not much in the eyes of God. It's a good thing, but it's not much in the eyes of God. But when it's inconvenient, and when it's uncomfortable, and we're still merciful to others, that is not worthy. That's a blessing. I want to add another aspect. Mercy is not simply to care for the physical needs of others, but also, which is very important, but it's to care for their spiritual well-being. It's not enough to live a private religious spiritual life. I think the world needs us. Now we are called to be light and salt to the world that's around us. We are the Samaritans who are called to see everyone as our neighbors. We are called to carry others to Christ through our prayers. We are called to invite others to the life of Christ within his church. How can we do that? We can, can we challenge ourselves to invite others to Christ and to his church? It takes bravery. It's not easy, especially when we have our own insecurities about the church. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be worried about what people will think of us. We don't need to 
change who we are. We have to preserve orthodoxy in a very real way. We should not try to conform to what other people are doing or what other churches are doing. We should be steadfast in our approach to delivering Christ. It takes bravery. Who can be brave enough to do what the priest and the Levite would not do? They would not bend down to serve our neighbors and invite them to Christ. Sure, our neighbor is a person who could live next door to each other. But our neighbor is our classmate. Our neighbor is our coworker. Our neighbor is our friend. Our neighbor is our family member. Our neighbor is the cashier or the waitress, whoever you see on a normal basis. Perhaps one of these people in your life is waiting for, for a Samaritan, waiting to lift them up and to carry them to Christ. After all, isn't this what Christ did for each one of us? So in summary, in today's gospel, we have this lawyer who comes to test Christ. And he asks, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's a very good question. It's an excellent question. The problem is, as we see, it was not the question, but the intent of the questioner, the motivation, the heart. So, this is a simple way of, the, of our Christian faith, to love God with everything that we have, to love God with everything that we are, to love our neighbors fervently. It's a simple but not always easy way of life. Why? Because loving others means thinking and living outside of yourself. Sometimes this is uncomfortable. To love is to risk. To love is to sacrifice and perhaps even to suffer. So in conclusion, we are taught by our Lord that anyone can love their neighbor and we are also taught that anyone can be your neighbor, the person you ought to love. St. Jerome writes, some think that their neighbor is their brother, family, relative, or their kinsman. Our Lord teaches us who our neighbor is in the gospel parable of a certain man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Everyone is our neighbor. And we should not harm anyone. If, on the contrary, we understand our fellow human beings to be only our brother and relatives, then then. Is it permissible to do evil to strangers? God forbid such a belief. We are neighbors, all people, all people, for we have one Father. Christ himself is the Samaritan, and he has taken each one of us as he has found us. No matter what condition that we are in, he has shown compassion on us, and he has carried us to a place of healing. He has poured out his mercy on us, and in return, he asks us who have received mercy from him to pour out love on those who need assistance. And we are encouraged and commanded to do more than just talk about love. We are encouraged to do and to be love. This is our high calling as adopted children of the Most High God. God is love. And he desires us to become love and to make love present. May he give us the courage to take risk and to have a heart for those who are in need around us. And may our Lord give us the strength and the sacrifice for others to follow the path of the cross and the path that leads that, that he has made clear to each one of us. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Yeah.